Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimp with the Limp, and I'm here with something a little different for you. I'm actually doing a little yapping about the newest issue of War Diary. Now, this isn't about the magazine itself, but a article that is in it. And unfortunately, my little girls dumped some, <laughs> some of their juice on it, so Mo's face got a little messed up. I'm sorry, Mo. I love you, buddy, but uh, my girls took you out. Sorry. But what I wanted to do is address the topic they had in here because they were doing a article that was talking about point counterpoint. All right. So two sides of the issue. And it's something that's been talked about a lot in multiple different aspects. And it's has the popularity of wargaming declined? Has it plummeted? Is it graying? Is it going away? We've heard this argument so many different times, and I just don't agree with it. I think the fact that my presence is here, barring the uh, the gray beard, I actually do have full head of dark hair. For some reason, my beard comes in gray. But there's uh, two guys to talk about. Mo is in my camp. He agrees with me that it's not an issue. We're just riding the waves as they come. And there's a lot of different reasons for the uh, why, the why of Wargaming going up and down and everything that we see happening with the market. Now, the person doing the point, which does think that Wargaming is plummeted and it's graying, and it's going down, is a gentleman named Louis uh, Pulsifer. I hope I pronounced that right, Louis. If I didn't, my apologies. But what I want to do is, in no way am I like attacking him, but I wanted to kind of refute some of the points that he brings up because he does bring up uh, a lot of points that point to things that we do see. But I think there are reasons behind we behind what we're seeing and some arguments to kind of counter some of the stuff that he points out as well. Now, to be fair, Lewis is 30 years older than I am, so we're going to have a vastly different perspective on things, right? And again, no offense against Lewis, because he understands that he is what he references, right? Because he talks about the fact that he is older and grayer. And that's what a lot of the hobby is. And I think there's a reason we see a lot of the hobby being towards the older and grayer side, but we are bringing in a lot of younger, fresher blood as well. It's not just a bunch of retirees sitting around playing war games. Now, yes, obviously I wasn't around from this, but from what I understand, when Wargaming first came out and it was Avalon Hill and they were selling mini copies, but this was like 60s, 70s, 80s, that time period, you really didn't have a whole lot of choices, especially in the, the tabletop market. There weren't computers, there weren't video games, there weren't tablets. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I think, was still very much in its infancy around that point. I think, when did they start? Somewhere around the 80s, 70s, 80s, somewhere around there. Someone will put it in the comments. So if you didn't want to play Monopoly and you wanted something deeper, then you would play a war game. OK, so that was very understandable. If you had a very small number of options and you wanted something tabletop uh, that you could get into, whether it was miniatures, because um, uh Damn, I'm a Games Workshop, I was brain farting there. Games Workshop got to start somewhere around, uh, what was it, late 70s, 80s time period when they started the, what was it, Space Crusade, I believe was one of their first ones where they had the Space Marines versus the aliens and everything. But all of that stuff was in its infancy. Tabletop gaming hadn't been. Tabletop gaming, like war gaming, has been around for hundreds of years. There's multiple iterations of it, and there's actually some good videos uh, that talk about it online. Definitely check that out, like the, the first war games that were actually brought to the table. Kings really got into it, but it was a very niche hobby then because you had to be rich to get into it. Cool part is the guy that designed it ended up uh, seeing that there was a market for it. So he created a more portable version, smaller, easier to wield version that he started marketing to the public and that started taking off and it was kind of the gestation of wargaming itself. So one of the first things that he brings up here in the article is that there's generational differences. And I think that's a very apt thing to point out. Yes, there are generational differences. Each generation has different things that they're going to be into, right? The, the 60s generation was into smoking weed, dropping acid, and yelling at the government, right? They, they had their hobbies. 
what was it? The 80s generation was into wearing bell bottoms and listening to bad music. Well, some bad music. There's some real good music from the 80s, but some really bad music from the 80s as well. <laughs> Let's see if you guys figure out what side I fall on. But because of the difference in generations, we now have more options. And this is going to be a point that I bring up into a lot of the points that he makes is the fact that we do have so much at our fingertips now that just would blow the mind of people 30, 40 years ago, right? Not, not even a, a full lifetime ago, just half of someone's life ago, things were totally different versus what we have now with video games and television, uh, VR, right? You know, you could even VR a tabletop war game now if you wanted to. Technology exists to do that type of stuff. So that's gonna change what people are into. And then obviously during this time period, there was a big explosion with Dungeons and Dragons that took off, which people saw. And then they started developing other games in that niche. And you started seeing other RPGs. You started seeing the rise of less generic Monopoly style board games and people getting involved with that. So with more options on the table, the pie got a little bit smaller because people had more options to choose from. It wasn't just apple anymore. You could have cherry, you could have peach, you could have pumpkin, you know, you, there are multiple options. I think that is a very valid reason why we've seen a decline in wargaming. Wargaming takes a lot of time. There's a huge time investment. We're talking about rule books that in some cases can be hundreds of pages, but our small rule books are something like 40 or 50 pages, and that's an astronomical rule book to some of the general run-of-the-mill uh, games that you see Euro style, style, uh, style games out there, like Terraforming Mars or something like that. You know, their their rule books are long if they're 19 or 20 pages, whereas that's a short rule book for us. So that in and of itself is going to be a difference when it comes to generations and just it, people's personal preferences. All right, now this is a point that I wholeheartedly disagree with. And he talks about this uh, cultural zeitgeist, this uh, thing where people don't want to lose. They don't want to lose anything. That's a, his big thing is they don't ever want to lose something in a game. They're so used to being able to reset or start over or whatever it is in the game that you're playing. And in war games, you lose stuff. You lose your forces, your pushback, you lose territory, you lose victory points, whatever it is you're going to lose. And he says that's not relevant to people today. Now that I wholly disagree with because some of the most popular games we see out there right now are games that put you to the edge when it comes to losing. The most popular video game out right now is Elden Ring. I'm playing the shit out of it, love it, right? Part of the Dark Souls series, check it out if you haven't. But it's a video game where you can lose. Now your character, long story short, can't lose everything. But if you die, you everything, all your runes, all your value that you had accrued up until that point is dropped to there. And if you don't recover that before you're killed again, then you lose all of that. And I've had that happen in the game. So the games where stuff is at, uh, at a loss, right? Where you do stand a chance of losing something are some of the most popular games out there right now. So I don't think that we have, now we have some, and of course there's always exceptions to the rule, but I don't think we have a, a culture of people who are afraid to lose things. Because the, the most popular ones out there are where people do stand a chance of losing something. The whole Dark Souls series was wildly popular. They relaunched the, the Demon Souls one. They turned it into a board game. Uh, they turned the Bloodborne series into a board game. And in these games, you, ch you stand the chance of losing the things that you have accrued. There's another one. I know I hark back to, to video games, but they're easy comparisons to make. Uh, RuneScape. Now, I've never played RuneScape, but from what I understand about it, you can lose your your assets, your materials, your weapons, your whatever it is, uh, stuff that you're carrying in your inventory. I think a small selection of it is uh, safeguarded, but there's a chance when you're killed, you can lose a lot. 
And that game is still wildly popular to this day. And it's running on something like a 20 year old engine, right? And people are still playing it. And then it was relaunched in a different form and people are still playing that. So this idea that people don't want to lose anything, I just don't think is accurate. I think people are willing to lose stuff. It just has to be in something that they're interested in. Now, his next point, I, I pretty well agree with him. He says we're in the age of instant gratification and short attention spans. And yeah, yeah, yeah he's right. I do think that is something that is going to negatively impact wargaming. Uh, and I see it even in my videos. That's uh, part of the reason I started doing five minute reviews and I try to get one of those out whenever I can. Uh, I have noticed that shorter videos get more attention than longer videos. That's the, the reason TikTok was doing so well. And there was that other app that was similar to TikTok. My wife really liked it. it began with a Y or something, I don't remember. I think it uh, collapsed a while back. But stuff like that, the, the 30 second, video the the minute entertainment everything in a little snippet give it as quick as you can and i think a lot of people have been spoiled by that easy access to the world everything is at their fingertips that they can't stand to not have something they're entertaining them at all hours of the day and the thought of sitting down and reading a rule book uh, for an hour right just to get used to it or some of these bigger games can take a while to set up especially uh if we're talking about a three or four map war game you know spread across the table and you've got a bunch of little counters that you've got to you know all across that board yeah that's not going to be for everyone but it is going to be for some people now the thing of it is though uh, short attention spans they existed then too though right people had short attention spans then it wasn't like the the 60s and 70s and 80s everyone had magnum opus levels of attention span although the 60s they might with the amount of pot that they smoked but uh, i just don't see it i think a lot of people they had short attention spans then we had short uh, attention spans now now it's a little worse now i'll agree but I don't think it's going to make that big of a deal the people who are not going to get into wargaming because of short attention span uh, they exist then, they exist now. Nothing really we can do about it. Now, see, he talks about his next couple of points. He talks about frail egos and he talks about what schools are teaching. But I think both are kind of the, the same point in the fact that, again, people aren't really being taught to lose. And in this one, I don't agree or I don't disagree with him. Um, Basically, long story short, you know that everyone gets a participation trophy and they stop keeping store, uh, score at soccer and football and peewee games and, you know, all that stupid crap that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, some kids are getting raised with that. And now we're seeing it because they don't want to play a game that does keep score or whatever the case may be. They're going to lose units. They're going to lose battalions. Their soldiers, they might grow attached to them. A game like Ambush where their soldiers can be killed off. You know, something like that might not appeal to them because they've never been taught that the world isn't a fair place and everyone, you know, doesn't always win. There's not a hundred first places. There's, you know, what is it? Um, what's that old saying? What do you call a second place? The first loser? Yeah, you know, that still rings true today, right? I agree. I think it is a little bit of disservice what's taught in school and it has caused some frail uh, egos. And we might be seeing that affect wargaming to an extent. But again, I don't know that there's enough evidence out there to say that it's having a definitive impact, that people aren't picking war games for that reason. Now, it might be possible, but there's been such an explosion of war game or not war gaming, but yes, war gaming too, of just gaming in general, thanks to things like Kickstarter. Kickstarter kicked it off, but there's a multitude of platforms like it. And that really revitalized the board gaming and tabletop industry. We see so many games constantly being released on Kickstarter. I can't even keep track of them. And I'm, I do this full time, right? I know others can't keep track of all the games uh, that get released. But again, I think that kind of harks back more to the just the sheer plethora of choices that we're seeing out with people. But I do see a lot of those games, they they go for cooperative, 
right? They have you working together towards something. But I don't necessarily think that that could be indicative of people having just the frail egos that he's referring to, some possibly. But I love playing a game where I'm working with someone to accomplish a goal. My wife and I love those games. We used to play uh, Shadows of Brimstone all the time or Descent 2nd Edition when I got the little app. And we'd go through the dungeons with our characters. And I remember she had her little tanky soldier guy and her little shield. And I had my guy with the mace and I was healing her. And we would work together as we were going through the dungeon. So I think more of it has to do with people working together instead of against each other and a rise in the popularity of that type of gaming. But it could possibly be that some people do have the, the frailer egos. Possible, but I don't think it's as big of a deal as he might be leaning in towards. Now, something else he brings up is the rise of video games, which is obvious because that's going to take away from tabletop gaming to an extent, to an extent. But again, just like I was referencing earlier, video games have helped war gaming. It's helped bring people into that hobby because some of the most popular games out there are war games. Uh, was it the Warhammer uh, Armageddon? I think it is. It's a hex and counter type war game. You've got like 2.5D sprites on it. Love that game. You've got the Imperials versus the Orcs. I'd love to see them expand it and have, um, you know, Tyranids and Chaos and all the other cool stuff. But it's a, it's a hex and counter war game, right? And plenty of video games do that. There's plenty of hex and counter war games that just have huge followings. Was it uh, Panzer Gold? I think is another one uh, that I have. Now, he does reference games that are a little different, like Total War or Hearts of Iron, as video games that aren't really war games. They're more resource management games. But I disagree with them not being war games because you do have to have that strategy. Not every war game out there is a hex encounter type war game. There's plenty of asymmetrical area control type war games where you're doing very similar things that you do in a game like Total War or especially Hearts of Iron and you have to think about your strategy. If anything, the the, the video games go to a deeper extent. You have to keep track of your production, your supplies, your oil, your production of iron, you know, all these different resources. So you can build things like uh, munitions and tanks and uh, ships and air, uh, aircraft, you know, everything that you need. And you need to build that diverse combat force so you can invade the enemy and take them out. And there's a lot of cool videos of people showing like hearts of iron, taking them out with just heavy tanks or you know whatever infantry divisions they use. But they are war games. And I think that that type of gaming is going to bring more people into that tabletop experience. Because a lot of people like me, I didn't even know the tabletop gaming, like war games, like the big, awesome, deep stuff. War gaming existed until I was into my late 20s, I think, maybe in my 30s somewhere. I didn't even know those games existed. I knew of things like Magic the Gathering or Monopoly or Dungeons and Dragons, but I didn't know of the others. I think a lot of it has to do with it hasn't been marketed, uh, marketed right and to the right people. It needs to get out there and instead of being treated as much like a, a niche small hobby that is just for us specialized group of grognards, expand it out there, let others see what's going on. Unfortunately, COVID is going to work against us a little bit in this regard because so many stores don't have as much open gaming. It's barely starting to recover now. But I would love to to walk in. Now, my local game store does have it because he's a war gamer. So back in the day before all that happened, you could walk in and you would see people playing Warhammer, X-Wing, and then a war game going on over here, like a, a hex encounter type war game. You'd see it at the table. I think we need to have more of that going on. People actually getting out there, let the public see it, make more videos, make it more popularized instead of keeping it snugged into just the, the secure group of us that know about it. But we even have things like Tabletop Simulator now, and that recreates the tabletop experience on your table 
And so many of the war games are recreated into that game. There's already mods out there where you can play many of your favorite GMT, Compass, Lock and Load uh, uh, Publishing, Academy games, all your favorite publishers. So many of their games are already on uh, Tabletop Simulator. And a lot of times I want to play something, but I just don't have the time to, you know, pull it out, spend half an hour setting it up. But if I could go click, click set it up, done. I mean, that is essentially what Vassal does, but this is something that's a little more modern and people do gravitate towards. I've done play testing with some designers and publishers using Tabletop Simulator, and we had just a, a great time doing it. We did that with uh, Flying Pig Games with one of their newer releases just a few months back. Now, he pushes just a few more points here, and I'm going to go into them quickly because I'm, I'm starting to draw on all of it. But lack of history and discomfort with real history, I do believe, are things that can be working against uh, wargaming and not just wargaming, but gaming in general, because we've seen people pushing to cancel games before they're even published without knowing anything about them, just because they hear some somebody complaining about it on the Twitter sphere. So they eh, no, let's cancel it. Uh, a lot of people do have a discomfort with history. And I think it is truly unfair and we are doing a disservice to our young people today by teaching them to judge history, the the past, all right, what people did then based on the morals and the values of today, right? We can't do that. They existed at a different period of time and what was normal for them is way not normal for us. But I'm sure in a hundred years, those people are going to be looking back at the things that we're doing now and go, what the hell were they thinking? They're a bunch of crazies. You know, how could they behave that way? We know so much better. And I'm sure they will. They'll do better. That's the, the nature of humankind. We're seeing that now, though, with so many people making things political. And I don't want to get into that, but it is going down that sphere and it is going to hurt wargaming probably more than any other type of gaming just because of the nature of what we deal with. War is ugly. It is brutal. So many bad things happen during war. Trust me. I know. War can hurt people. I get it. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't explore it through gaming and media and art just like we do every other subject, right? Movies, books, novels, games. It's how we do everything. He does talk about how to bring more people in the hobby, and he makes the reference of trying to maybe emulate more of Euro style, stuff like that. And I don't think that that's the way to go. I think we need to push wargaming strength, and the strength is the fact that it is different than Euro style games. The rule books are bigger. The games are deeper. They do last longer. There are more pieces on the board. You do have to have a different mindset to play the game. You're not just rolling a couple of dice and moving your little car token, hoping you pass go and collecting $200. There's so much more going on the table than just the, the run of the mill games out there. Not to say that there aren't good Euro style games out there. There are plenty of games out there that have a great system set. My horrible weakness is miniature dungeon crawl style games. My absolute all time favorite has always been Core Space. Love that game, it's freaking phenomenal. I always recommend it every time I get a chance to get in front of the camera because it's just awesome. One of the better playing ones. But that's, the, that's my weakness is those types of games. But it doesn't mean I don't like war gaming. We need to push more games that do a crossover, right? The crossover just a little bit. David Thompson's great with this. Uh, some of his games like um, Undaunted, right? His Undaunted series does a great job of being kind of an introductory level crossover style war game that's just enough into the war gaming scene that we like it just enough into that Euro general run of the mill type gaming that they like it. So there's crossover and someone will play that and they'll go, oh, this is cool. What other types of games like this exist? And then they'll fall down the rabbit hole. We'll we are all in and I'll end up with a wall of shame, just like the rest of us have of hoping that we'll finally get that huge monster out and play it one day which for me is War in the Pacific. I don't have that one yet. I'm going to get it on my shelf one day 
and I'm going to play it. Before I die, I'm going to get War in the Pacific played. Now, again, this is an attack on Lewis, anything like that. I think he did perfectly fine with his article, and he brought up a lot of valid points. I'm not going to go over Mo's counterpoints because a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here, he brought up, and then he has his own points as well. Uh, if you guys are interested in reading it, check out the latest War Diary. I will say they did send me the magazine. They do send me the War Diary uh, magazine to read, and it is cool. They got a lot of different articles in here, cover a lot of different games. It actually showed me a game that I had missed, Captain C by Legion Games. I actually just got that one in, so look for a guesses from Gimpy's Gal. She's going to be guessing it. I'm going to be playing that on the table here very soon, but it looks awesome. I can't wait to try that one out. But yeah, I just think we're different. We do things different. We need to push our differences and show that wargaming is a different niche of the hobby. It is something that if you want something larger, bigger, deeper, more chrome to it, this is this is the direction you need to go in because we've got that niche. We can cover it. If you want a game that uh, can be played on a six by four table or even bigger where you're recreating the Battle of Guadalcanal with ships and aircraft and all that other cool stuff. Hey, we got that set up, but we can do it with spaceships. We can do it with ancients. We can do it with hoplites. We can do it you know, World War II soldiers, whatever era of gaming you're into, whatever part of history you like, you're into Napoleonic, Civil War, future, fictional thir uh, Third World War, war gaming has you covered. If anything, I think with the influx of video games and now the crossover that we're seeing with apps coming into gaming itself, more stuff like Tabletop Simulator, the rise of things like Kickstarter, which is bringing more games and fresher ideas to the table that we were in the gully, but now we're starting to go back up here because more games are coming out than I can even hope to cover, even by a small margin. And I think that's going to keep going this direction because they're not going to be publishing games unless they're making a profit off of it, which means more and more and more people are coming to the hobby. All right, but put your comments down below. Let me know what you think. Do you think uh, I'm right? Do you think Lewis is right? Do you think we're both right? What are your thoughts on it? Put them down below. You guys take care. I'll see you in the next one.